Yes, uh, shall we start, sir? Shall we start? Yes, yes. Uh, Jairam, sir, shall we start? Yes, yes. Good morning to one and all gathered here. So this online webinar entitled Raised Advances in Satellite Propulsion System in collaboration with Vayu Shastra Aerospace Private Limited and RTBI based incubated startup company residing in IIT Madras campus. So let me take this opportunity to say a few words about Hindustan Institute of Technology. The Hindustan Institute of Technology is now an autonomous institution started in the year of 2007, uh, which is accredited with NAC A grade, which consists of seven UG programs and four UG programs. Currently, four departments of Hindustan Institute of Technology, namely Aeronautical Engineering, Mechanical Engineering, Computer Science and Engineering, and EC Department are accredited to National Board of Accreditation. The Hindustan Institute of Technology is an autonomous institution from 2020 and 2021 academic year. So next, Vaisastra Aerospace Private Limited. Uh, Vaisastra Aerospace Private Limited is not, not new to Hindustan Institute of Technology. They are already associated with us. So they organize many programs and many internship programs with our uh, Department of Aeronautical Engineering. So on behalf of the Department of Aeronautical Engineering, I welcome Jagdish Kanna, founder and CEO of Vaisatra Aerospace and his team for organizing this program with us. And uh, we would like to place our sincere gratitude for uh, Jagdish Kanna. And we congratulate Jagdish Kanna and his team. So who is awarded for the Award for Emerging Innovative Entity of the Year 2021? Uh, I welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So next, I would like to uh, introduce and welcome our research person, Professor Dr. Jairaman, sir. He is currently working as a research professor in Middle East University, Ankara, Turkey. He is a former principal scientist at Department of Aerospace Engineering, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, Madras, Chennai. He has completed his Master of Engineering at the Aeronautical at Department of Aeronautical Engineering, Madras Institute of Technology, Anna University, and doctorate from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, India, in the field of nanoparticles production and characterization and its application in aerospace profession. He was awarded for Sandwich Postdoctorate Fellowship for Science, Technology, and Services. Embassy of France, New Delhi, India. He has started intensive research activities at ICARE on the energetized of metal combustion of aluminum and magnesium for space propulsion application and for future mass sample return mission in propellant protection concept. He has designed, fabricated, and demonstrated the pyro igniter and pyro starter development of gas turbine engine application the project sponsored by Gas Turbine Research and Establishment and Defense Research and Development Organization, DRDO, Government of India, at the cost of 9.625 lakhs. He had completed the project title, Development of Design Methodology for Optimizing Space Film Damper for Aero Gas Turbine Engine and Experimental Verification Studies under the scheme of gas turbine enabling technology initiative sponsored by aeronautical research and development board DRDO, government of india at the cost of rupees 1.88 crores he has also contributed as a co-investigator for many projects in government of india he worked as a senior researcher at ICARE France for working the optimizing gasification of high as content coals for electricity generation. Uh, in optimization of France, Netherlands, Turkey, and India, and Indo-European collaboration projects also. He has worst experience in renewable energy and has showcased his ability in publishing 28 peer-reviewed journal internationally. He has visited several countries like France, Sweden, Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, USA, China, and 
Canada recently in Turkey and presented 26 international conference papers on behalf of Department of Aeronautical Engineering and Hindustan Institute of Technology. I welcome research professor Dr. K. Jairaman to this function. I welcome you, sir. Hello, sir. So I'll give one short introduction about uh, Jairaman, sir. Yes. I'm an audible, I'm an audible. So, uh, Vai Shastra, when, when we entered as a startup inside IIT, uh, so we are we are like a budding, like we are a very young entrepreneurial team. So very young uh, bunch of aeronautical engineers, but I am the only one done master. With my, my whole team is like, they they are like just finished final year and we are very inside. And uh, we needed guidance, technical guidance as well, business guidance as well. So IIT usually uh, uh, provides us with all this mentorship, all this uh, journey mentor. Our journey mentor is uh, TTK, uh, Ravi Chandran sir. He is a former MD, TTK prestige group. So he was uh, guiding us in a business aspect. But technical aspect, I was looking for a person who could guide us. And uh, our uh, our team is like, it's like most of the, our team, the whole, in, whole team is like introvert team. So we won't... Uh, uh, like communicate very uh, like so very easily to people. So we rumba thangi thangi na pesham da mari team. So we need a someone rumba path path guide pan da mari rumba and then we were looking for. Then uh, we got connected to Jai Raman sir. He was uh, principal project officer at IIT Madras NCTRD that time. So we approached for a small uh, uh, program. Then he slowly uh, started uh, getting to uh, know. Uh, then uh, we asked him, sir, mentor, can you be our mentor, technical mentor? Then uh, he started guiding us in a lot of areas. He, he helped us in design our college program, how to go about a lot of things. And uh, there are a lot of research projects right now going on. Uh, so we framed our uh, research team as well. We have an R&D team now separately, and that's doing a lot of research on one side. So, Jairam sir is like uh, guiding us throughout. So, every time uh, he, he never hesitated to pick call or he never hesitated to reply back. So, he is uh, uh, one of, becomes like pillar of a wise uh, Happy to be uh, associated with Jairam sir. Uh, Jairam sir, you can now, I think you can take over the session. Thanks. Um... Jagadish, <coughs> for my introduction on the what about the Hindustan Institute of Technologies uh, collaboration with the Vice Astra. So I think uh, they have introduced me about all these things. So then uh, I will directly go to my presentation. Okay, fine. So then, uh, yeah, myself about uh, KJ Raman, uh, PhD from IIT Madras. So I will give the talk about the recent advances in space for satellite propulsion systems. So satellite propulsion system means it includes both uh, like uh, rocket launching as well as uh, uh, after launching the satellite in the particular orbit, then uh, we have to control the orbit also. After some time, uh, the satellite will not uh, retain its original uh, orbit, which we have launched initially. So. In that, in that case, we have to give some small amount of uh, thrust to uh, regain the same uh, orbit. Okay, we'll see everything. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> so spacecraft propulsion system. So spacecraft propulsion system is uh, based on jet propulsion are used in rocket motors. So principle of rocket propulsion was uh, known as far back as like uh, 360 BC actually. Because uh, that time that uh, the Chinese have a lot of explosives, so even now also they are uh, uh, dominant uh, in the cracker industries. So they have a lot of uh, these uh, explosive uh, availabilities. So they have started this uh, <clears throat> one minute. So 13th century, it's a solid rocket powered uh, arrows were used by Chinese military. So after the, the Second World War and the Cold War, after the Second World War, uh, so there is no war to took any between the countries. So after that, the Cold War has uh, started. So in that time, the rocket and missile development in modern time is uh, started. 
So then the latter space opened up for the exploration and commercial exploitation by satellites and robot spacecraft. So, so, so then in that case, so the um, uh, actually uh, Germany as well as Russia has uh, pioneered in the rocket launching technology because the P2 rocket, everything is used for uh, Second World War, but even uh, world, uh, during the World War, it is used as like a missiles. So missiles means it may, it may not go beyond 20 kilometer or something like that. So but still, they have used uh, rocket because uh, compared to air breathing propulsion systems, rockets can uh, uh, give higher amount of thrust and it can go very fast. That's the major advantage when compared to the air breathing propulsion systems. So after that, the, in 1957, I think you know everybody that the 1957 Russia sent this bus. Uh, launched the first uh, Sputnik, satellite, uh, Sputnik satellite into the space. So, okay, so that is this lecture focus on analysis and performance of spacecraft propulsion systems and the key features and performance characteristics of existent planned near future propulsion systems for use on aircraft are summarized. Okay, so it is about uh, some generic case. So, why we have to launch satellites? So, because if we launch satellites, if it, uh, because in uh, uh, PSLV, that is polar satellite, uh, polar synchronous satellite uh, orbit uh, launch vehicle or uh, geosynchronous satellite uh, launch vehicle. So, they, this is the two kind of uh, um, rockets we are launching in India and everywhere, okay, and all around the world. So, India is in the fifth, fifth or sixth place now. Yeah, so if we send the satellite and uh, from the satellite, if you are uh, giving uh, signals to the earth, so it can cover more surface, more area, rather than if you are keeping some, uh, your antennas in mountain for about some uh, one or two, uh, some uh, 100 feet, sorry, 1000 feet or 2000 feet. So that is the major advantage of the satellite. So, okay, so that if you see that, <clears throat> Satellites can cover a major uh, area for the communication uh, aspect. So <clears throat> in the future, how it can be evolved? So that is, it shows here. So in the stage one, you can uh, see that uh, the signals are coming from satellite to the ground. Then we can process the surveillance data. After the surveillance data, it can go to onsite confirmation surveillance drone. So after that uh, drone is uh, <clears throat> getting all the signals, then it, it yeah obviously it will uh, coupled with the CCTV camera. So once the, it reaches the CCTV camera, we have to use the artificial intelligence systems so that it can uh, automate the system by itself. Like that, that's why this uh, nowadays this uh, Google has launched some uh, uh, driverless car. So how it can be possible? We have to have higher space resolution in the ground. That means it should have resolution of like uh, one to five meter. So then only we can have the car as to where, where the car has to, when the car has to turn and where the has, car has to turn and where it has to accelerate or deaccelerate, something like that. So that could be possible in the future. But still, this artificial intelligence will give the higher uh, application, variety of applications. Okay, it's like, yeah, it's artificial intelligence driving integrated detection to tracking architectures involving diverse sensor solutions. So these are all uh, in matured, uh, it is not in uh, reached the mature technology, but still it is undergoing, but it could be possible in the near future. Okay, so then uh, human transportation legacy in the future. So as of now, what uh, what is our, um, Humans' uh, legacy is like, uh, yeah, we are uh, in uh, 2030, we are planning to keep some uh, moon station in the moon. So that means now we have ISS only, that is International Space Station. So that is, it's around some uh, 500 to 600 kilometers from the Earth's surface. That is the, yeah, it, that is used for many countries for uh, scientific experiments then we have to leap to next level like moon station into the 2030. Then in 2040, yeah, it could be possible we have some Mars station also. 
then uh, beyond 2040 we can see look for uh, other planets but as of now so due to covid and other things uh, there is some uh, stall in the space research but but then you it can it could be further uh, going to the next step okay so need of propulsion systems why we require propulsion systems so place the payloads into the orbit and launch the propulsion is used then send the payloads to the moon or to the planets space propulsion is used then position adjust and maintain the maintain orbits of space craft by orbit control that is like auxiliary propulsion is used then attitude control orient the space craft by attitude control that auxiliary propulsion also called reaction control systems orbit control is like once the uh, satellite is deorbiting from its original orbit let's say if uh, geosynchronous satellite uh, satellite means it, it could be around some 35000 km altitude okay so after some time uh, due to some uh, air friction and uh, some other factors it may deviate from its original uh, 35000 km altitude like to 34000 or 33000 in that case uh, we have to use some auxiliary propulsion systems after one or two years then we have to regain its original orbit that is for orbit control attitude control means the satellite has to focus always towards the earth that is our ultimate aim because the communication signal is direction oriented so if the satellite sensors are uh, not focused in to the earth towards the earth so this uh, communication signal cannot reach by the ground sensors so that is called attitude control so always the satellite uh, the radar system the antenna system should be work, um, towards always focused towards on the earth surface so that is called attitude control so that for that also we have to use some reaction control systems okay so then uh, yeah we have seen the same thing so then uh, yeah that is uh, transfer the aircraft spacecraft like used for interplanetary travels and position the aircraft is for orbit control and over in the space for attitude control and the jet, while jet propulsion systems for launching rockets also called primary propulsion systems spacecraft satellites are operated by secondary propulsion systems okay then uh, characteristics of space, the spacecraft propulsion systems so in order to fulfill attitude and orbit orientational orbit operational requirements of spacecraft and spacecraft propulsion systems are characterized in particular by very high velocity increment capability so we have to have the acceleration of kilometer per second and low thrust levels to yeah with low acceleration levels and continuous operation mode of for for orbit control the pulse operation mode for attitude control and the predictable accurate and repeatable performance such like impulse bits we require it's not like continuous so it's simple bits impulse bits and reliable leak free long time operation it should be storable propellant so it should uh, it should be chemically stable even on a dead surface like uh, at room temperature and pressure but it has to be chemically stable at higher altitude also there were the high temperature and uh, yeah sometimes low pressure and low density and uh, so in that case the uh, propellant has to be chemically stable so the minimum predictable thrust exhaust treatment surface is required <clears throat> so classified according to the type of energy source so propulsion system so so i will give some simple example so in air, in earth we are using some uh, petrol or diesel or some other uh, uh, gas as a fuel so where in which it contains uh, the energy in terms of chemical bonds so that chemical bond energy is converted into thermal energy by having combustion or reaction so that means uh, petrol that is uh, carbon uh, hydroxide hydrocarbon so it is c equal or h22 plus oxygen it give it becomes uh, co2 plus h2 and it gives some energy that means thermal energy so that energy is converted converted into mechanical energy and we are driving the um, earth moving vehicles but in case of uh, rockets we require both fuel as well as oxidizer in the as a total energy content so in that case we have to use uh, different kinds of propellants so 
so our ultimate aim is uh, in, uh, in earth moving vehicle we are converting this chemical energy into thermal energy then thermal energy into mechanical energy so in uh, rockets we have to convert this chemical energy that is uh, available in the chemical bonds convert into thermal energy then thermal energy should be converted into kinetic energy that means we have to we require very high velocity exhaust velocity jet that can be achieved by the different kind of chemical propellants it's like okay so then in chemical we can go uh, cold gas it's like a compressed gas so even uh, if you have the balloon so if you just put some hole what will happen so it will give some uh, thrust opposite to the exhaust velocity direction so it will give yeah it produces some small amount of thrust then like vaporizing liquid like propane so if you are uh, uh, keeping the propane at particular temperature it will be in uh, liquid state if you are uh, increasing the temperature so it becomes liquid so it become gas so then it, it will give some kind of exhaust uh, jet velo jet velocity then it will give some small amount of thrust but that is not at all required for uh, launching big satellites so it's like uh, in india we are uh, launching around some 2000 to 3000 kg of payload of uh, satellites so in that case we have to go for solid propellant or mono propellant like hydrazine and uh, bi propellant like uh, monomethyl hydrazine plus nitrous oxides as a oxidizer so in solid propellant means both the solid as well as fuel that means uh, oxidizer sorry fuel plus oxidation should be in solid form then mono propellant means it, it is a hydrazine so then uh, bi propellant means it is it contains uh, both uh, mmh that is monomethyl hydrogen is a fuel nitrous oxide is the oxidizer so it, it should contain both so in that case uh, it, it can give the required amount of thrust to propel the rockets then electrical electrical we have different kinds of uh, things it's like uh, electrothermal means is a resistor jet and arc jet and electromagnetic means uh, magnetoplasma thruster developed dynamic thruster and uh, electrostatic means rat and field emission so these are all used in spacecraft control systems only because as i told the energy should be freely available so that the energy conversion could be less energy conversion efficiency could be less so so that we can achieve our optimize the mission uh, requirements so if you are uh, going for electrical uh, kind of systems we electrical energy is not freely available from the nature so we have to produce the electricity either from uh, coal based thermal power plants or uh, solar uh, cells or solar cells also this efficiency is maximum 22 percentage but it may not uh, adequate for uh, launching the satellites and uh, or uh, we have to go, yeah dr get it from some other source like hydroelectric or something like that so in that case what will happen so you have to convert your uh, uh, let's say if you are uh, using some diesel uh, diesel or petrol generator that means that chemical energy is converted into electrical energy uh, by forming this uh, same uh, again this uh, uh, conversion type so if you are converting this uh, gasoline or uh, that is uh, petrol or diesel into electrical energy it takes some energy conversion packs okay then this electrical uh, we, we get the electrical energy after that electrical energy we can use this the electrothermal and electromagnetic electrostatic so that is the our uh, bottleneck situation because it is not freely available so we have lot of energy conversion devices and other aspects are coming into picture and uh, whenever we are uh, talking about this space launching uh, the rockets or space launching vehicles we have to reduce the weight so in that case if you want to have less weight then we have to readily we have to use the propellant which is readily available like solid propellant or bi propellant but if you go to uh, at a very high altitude like in orbit like eslp or uh, geosynchronous orbit at 35000 uh, km 35000 km we can use some solar uh, pv cells to produce electricity so for uh, spacecraft attitude control or orbit control electrical uh, uh, propulsion systems is used but whereas for uh, uh launching the satellites from uh, earth surface we have to rely on only on solid propellant mono propellant
liquid propellant uh, categories. Okay, then reaction control system. So it is uh, what is the what is meant by reaction control system? It's like reaction jets. It's like produces controls force by expenditure of mass. Then another thing is like solar sails or uh, magnetic arc. It's like a magnetic isles which produces control force by interaction with the environmental field. Then momentum transport devices is like reaction flywheels. You'll see that which produce no net control force but simply transfer angular momentum to or from the spacecraft. So you can see this. Uh, Attitude control system it's like determines current attitude from sensors and target attitude from onboard computer system is taken and error between target and current attitude is decreased using the attitude actuators. And the magnetic torque. So it is uh, majorly used in low earth orbit missions and no fuel is required at magnetic field is used to create external torque and magnitude of torque is very low. This is a singularity all in there is a singularity all the time in the direction of earth magnetic fields and low precision. But wherever it is required, we, are, we can use it because there is no <clears throat> external energy source required for this magnetic target. So it is used by its earth magnetic, uh, freely available mag earth magnetic field. Then reaction wheels. So that is also used in several missions and no fuel is required, precision is high. Only internal torques are created so it can get saturated. Many moving parts. So this is the limitations here. It's it's going to fail. So this is also used. And <clears throat> momentum transfer device operation. You can see that reaction wheels are used for three axis st stabilization and orientation of the satellites. Each reaction wheel is connected with a larger gyro in the same axis. I think you can uh, you could have uh, seen the gyroscopic effect. So if if a flywheel or any rotational uh, medium is rotating at a particular direction, it creates orthogonal momentum. So that that kind of uh, <coughs> thrust is produced by this. The complete control loop electronics is integrated with the reaction wheels. Each axis gets the angle or angle velocity command from the onboard data handling system. It's like central processor. But all other, all other activities are controlled by the reaction wheel itself. Just one minute. Then control moment gyroscope. So used in all type of missions and no fuel is required, precision is high. Only internal thoughts are created so can get saturated. So very high torques are generated used in bigger satellites. So this is also possible, but it's a many moving parts. So, so in uh, ground-based system means we can easily replace the, yeah, the prepared items or something like that in space. It's not possible. So we have to use reliable systems. Sometimes uh, many moving parts go to fail. Okay, then cold gas system. So as I mentioned, it's a, uh, here in the cold gas systems, we are just converting this pressure energy into kinetic energy. So that means the compressed gas, it's like a, it's a compressed gas, it's a pressure energy. So that pressure energy can be converted into kinetic energy. So that is, it can be used as a nitrogen or high vapor pressure hydrocarbons like propane, like CPH8. And main performance, it's like advantages of how it is, where it can be used and what is the advantages it's like. So it is, yeah, it can be used in all type of missions. Fuel is required, precision is low. External thoughts are created by expelling the cold gas and not usually used to control attitude rather than used to desaturate reaction wheels. So it's mostly used for uh, attitude control. So it's a simple system. It's like how uh, the cold gas systems uh, works. So you can see that uh, high pressure nitrogen is stored in a particular cylinder and we have to use some, whenever we are using some high, high pressure uh, systems, we have to use some regulator valve and relief wall. So after that, because sometimes uh, the pressure can go beyond level. So in that case, we have to use some relief wall so that uh, we can safeguard the system. So after that uh, relief wall, so the uh, high pressure uh, nitrogen gas is supplied into the nozzle. So where the pressure energy can be converted into kinetic energy so that so it will give some thrust. The vaporized system means, yeah. So we use propane 
so we have to use some vaporizer so that liquid uh, that is propane uh, can be converted into higher vaporized like uh, gas so then uh, it can go to the nozzle there it can create the required amount of thrust so yeah it's like uh, yeah so this is what the slide will fall so then the vaporizing liquid is characterized by a liquid propellant pressure by its own equilibrium vapor pressure and ex expulsion its vapor through nozzle now to provide completely vaporized gas the vaporized is included a liquid cold gas system so the nitrogen organ krypton and free and ammonia propane have been employed in operational space craft but nitrogen has been most common cold gas propellant because why we are using this uh, inert gases means it, it, it is it is not having any reaction with compounds it's like uh, uh, it's not uh, reacting with the stored systems so that material so it is always in at any conditions that's why we are using it. inert gases okay so then you can see the cold gas propellants uh, properties it's like uh, if you are using hydrogen or methane nitrogen argon or freon so you can see the molar mass our ultimate aim is uh, ultimate requirement means how much exhaust velocity it can produce so you can see it's like uh, maximum exhaust velocity is like 2668 if you are using hydrogen and uh, it is coming down if you are uh, going to the free and also like that and vaporizing liquid means it could be ammonia propane or carbon dioxide so that also it's limited you can see the maximum velocity reached by the ammonia is 950 meter per second and carbon dioxide is 598 meter per second so this is the limitation here so it's like a stream thruster it's just for example so it can produce 20 milli newton of thrust so it was used in um, eureka hipparchus and astro space applications so you can see it's a simple uh, thing so it's a nozzle and uh, it's a solenoid valve and uh, yeah so it's only high pressure assist high pressure gas is converted into thrust so the advantage is it's reliable uh, low cost uh, propulsion system so very, very low thrust can be achieved this is contamination of exhaust gases like this thing the disadvantage is it's low isp it's like less than 950 newton second per uh, kg so that is the major disadvantage so can, so so wherever it is required so we can use it for uh, so for uh, low thrust requirement applications then categories of hot gas systems so in the cold gas systems we are just converting pressure energy into kinetic energy here hot gas systems both pressure as well as thermal energy converted into kinetic energy so that we can get very high level of thrust required very high level of thrust so in order to obtain higher isp in the first uh, instance uh, higher uh, vs is needed so this can be achieved by increasing the temperature of the exhaust gas to be expanded in the thruster nozzle hot gas systems are the most common type of propulsion systems used for space applications as i mentioned so here it's a first one is liquid propellant it's a oxidizer and the fuel so it has to be stored in different uh, tanks and it has to be pressurized before it enters into the rocket combustion chamber where the combustion is taking place so the high pressure energy as well as the thermal energy is converted by is thermal energy is formed by the combustion uh, process so then uh, it uh, send it uh, supplied into the nozzle the conversion diversion nozzle because whenever we are using uh, when whenever we require supersonic flow in the nozzle we require always uh, conversion diversion nozzle so that is then another thing is uh, hybrid so the oxidizer could be liquid or gas and the fuel is in solid form so there uh, again uh, there is a combustion is taking place in the rocket uh, chamber and uh, it will give it, it can give the enough amount of thrust in the solid propellant both fuel and as well as oxidizer in solid form so it is it's like a cracker which we are using it's uh, both fuel as well as oxidizer is contained in a solid form then if you are giving some amount of ignition energy what will happen to the crackers it will give enough amount of thrust or uh, sound something like that. so this is the uh, the same it's it's also same thing okay so 
different kind of liquid propellants. So you can see that uh, chemical formula, melting point, normal point density, and heat of combustion, and uh, the specific impulse. So if you are using hydrazine, yeah, we can get up about some 2,300 meter per second. It's like uh, monomethyl hydrazine means we can get up to 3,200 meter per second. Then UDMH and aeromycin. So these are all like a contentable liquid propellants. But majorly we are using this unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. So you can see like 280. 2,800 uh, meter per second we can achieve. That my ISP means it is around some uh, 280 seconds. Okay, that means we have to divide it by gravitational force so that we can get the ISP. And uh, oxidizers, yeah, we are uh, always using this uh, nitrogen uh, oxides, different kind of nitrogen oxides it's like uh, nitrogen hydroxide, like uh, N2O4 or uh, MO in first or second. These are also used. So, but mostly we are using N2O4. So, yeah, we can get uh, the thrust. Uh, it's the same thing. So, uh, the unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine uh, thrust. So, this is the schematic of the different uh, kind of liquid propulsion systems. So, you can see that uh, uh, as I mentioned, the pressure has to be increased before it enters into the combustion chamber of the liquid propellant. Okay, that liquid oxidizer as a liquid fuel. So for that, we can use some high pressure uh, cylinders, high pressure gas cylinders, so that this uh, uh, oxidizer <coughs> is pressurized and before it enters into the combustion chamber, fuel also is uh, pressurized. That is one kind of propulsion, so this, uh, configuration and another kind is we have to we can draw the oxidizer and fuel and we can use a turbine pump to increase the pressure before it enters into the combustion chamber because always i told in the combustion chamber it has to send it send it with very very high pressure so then only we can get enough amount of thrust that means uh, we can convert uh, pressure energy and kinetic uh, thermal energy into kinetic energy so that <clears throat> we can increase the overall thrust so that this is called a pressure fed system and the pump fed system. Mostly both the systems are used, but in uh, rocket launching applications, mostly the pump fed systems are used, even though it is uh, axillary other uh, devices, because high pressure systems, it's like uh, cylinders and other things, it, uh, it takes some amount of weight. Instead of that, we can use this uh, pump fed system. So for long uh, space uh, flight applications, so our only storable propellants which can be stored for a long period and still tanks are used. Then launch propellant, uh, sorry, liquid propellant systems. So it's what is the advantages and disadvantages it's like. So bipropellant systems can operate the by propellant, it's like example like a monomethyl hydrazine and an oxidized like a 2 over produce thrust. And here the propulsion systems are uh, needed for spacecraft injection for the orbit delivered by the launcher into the circular orbit or sometimes elliptical orbit at all. And during station phases like for orbit control and attitude control. Therefore, these propulsion systems are also called unified propulsion systems because it is used for both satellite launching as well as orbit control and attitude control of spacecrafts. Then monopropellant systems also. In the liquid propellant, we can see that monopropellant. So that means it is both because we don't require fuel as well as oxidizer in different uh, tank. So we can use like uh, N2H4 with the hydrazine. So we can, uh, for wherever uh, the low thrust requirement is specific, we can use this uh, kind of monopropellant systems. So these are all like, what is the different advantages and uh, some limitations also it is there. So that whenever we are using some hydrogen, we have to use some catalytic uh, surface to make the hydra hydrazine decomposition. 
so that uh, after the uh, hydrogen decomposition also it produces some uh, in a uh, sorry some reactive gases that, that could be avoided by having some uh, coating of surfaces so this is for some example of like a catalytic thruster monopropellant hydrogen thruster nominal thrust is around uh, 1 newton it was developed by the austrian okay it's the same thing so it is uh, it's a previous it was a schematic diagram it's the operational diagram of the hydrogen thruster so you can see that uh, the solenoid valve it's always required uh, for uh, controlling the flow rate of hydrogen so you can see the catalytic surface in the react uh, combustion chamber with the catalyst so whenever it uh, the hydrogen is flown over the catalytic surface so it de decomposes and it produces some uh, heat so that can be converted into kinetic energy in the sorry in the nozzle so you can see the different kind of uh, characteristics of uh, hydrogen thruster it's based on your uh, based on the supply pressure the thrust could be increased the not one edges and reserve one edges it's the same thing so it is like a simplicity and reliability and low cost propulsion systems other than cold gas and st space storable for long periods it's more than 12 years also it could be there is no aging problem aging characteristics and the low thrust capability and moderate thrust levels it's like less than 400 newtons Sorry, more than 400 newtons also we can achieve from this thing and uh, disadvantage it's like wherever this uh, specific thrust of 230 is 2300 newtons second per kg so we can use it and uh, catalyst life also limited and uh, because it uh, produces ammonia so that ammonia comes into the atmosphere so whenever it comes into the atmosphere it can damage the satellite outer surface because ammonia is a corrosive gas so so in that uh, kind of situation we have to use some satellite uh, should be safeguarded by having some coating from the ammonia gas then by propellant system so as i mentioned uh, it's uh, both fuel and oxidizer in liquid state and uh, is also used so this is for a simple example of uh, operational diagram of bipropellant astrium thruster yeah you can see the photograph of that so it is like you can see the upstream launch valve and uh, bipropellant inlet and downstream valve and uh, as a injector and you can see the copper ring and the combustion after the combustion chamber we have the nozzle because uh, as i mentioned in the nozzle should accelerate the flow to very high velocity so for that we require very high area ratio that means area ratio of uh, area, area area ratio means exit area of the nozzle to the throat area so it should be around 40 to 50 so then only we can achieve the very high velocity so that we can get higher level of thrust it's operational diagram of uh, the astrium satellite so again it's the same thing so it's a bipropellant thruster developed by the astrium so as a, so it, it it should be cooled also because it's a very high temperature is uh, produced in the combustion chamber the nozzles uh, the nozzle wall the nozzle material cannot withstand more than 1000 degree or something like that so in that case we have to use some counter flow cooling or regenerative cooling so that we can safeguard the nozzle surface so it's always whenever we are uh, talking about high pressure high temperature systems so our material uh, temperature uh, that safe safe working temperature it is maximum if we use uh, internal alloys it could be like 1200 or something like that even turbine plates aircraft gas turbine turbine plates it is 1200 only so beyond that means yeah we have to use uh, some kind of cooling so that 
you can uh, control the temperature during the operation it's always there whenever we are uh, talking about whenever we are dealing with the high temperature systems yeah, it's it can produce some 10 newtons on the above that so as i mentioned it is uh, first one is uh, generation regenerative cooled the area ratio is like 150 here and re generation radiation cooled platinum surface so there uh, the dsp is like 317 to 319 seconds and the uh, generation radiation cooled the radiation cooled also it is possible so that is uh, if you are using some platinum kind of material there you can see the area ratio 300 and isp could be you can achieve maximum of 320 seconds 22 seconds and the uh, generation of radiation cooled then uh, and cmc is a composite material carbon based uh, carbon metal based composite so its area ratio is 300 so we can achieve isp of around more than 324 seconds so it's uh, propellant tanks so as i mentioned normally the propellant tank should not be yeah sharp corner it should be like curved surface so that you can see the inside uh, we have some stiffness because it's a high pressure so pressure means it uh, it's not like a normal pressure it should be like 30 to 40 40 or 70 bar so in that case we have to have some stiffness for uh, increasing the mechanical strength of the propellant tanks so you can see the different kind of tanks and uh, the unified propulsion systems as i mentioned it is like um, it's based on by propellant systems used in uh, orbit transfer uh, applications and the system is composed essentially of like one of uh, 400 newton apache booster for orbit transfer maneuvers and uh, it is for 14 to 10 newton thrusters for to orbit and attitude control mm -hmm. okay so the main advantage of pi propellant uh, this liquid propellant system it's like it can produce the thrust level from 4 to 500 newton thrust for uh, satellite uh, applications and for rocket applications it's, it can produce more than yeah sometimes more than uh, 45 kilo newton also the nimble speed could be like 10 power minus 2 newton seconds per orbit control then thrust specific impulse yeah we can reach up to 2850 newton second per kg for steady state operations and uh, maximum of uh, 311 to 311 uh, specific impulse also we can achieve uh, the thrust is more than 400 newtons then thrust specific impulse it's like more than 1000 newton second per kg for pulse mode operations and system specific impulse could be more than 2800 newton second per kg and advantage is it's like high thruster specific impulse it's like more than 3110 newton second per kg and highest system specific impulse it's like more than 2800 newton second per kg so for low mass systems and high thrust capability it's up to 45 kilo newton and disadvantage is it's like a bi propellant systems complexity with added walls regulators etc and high cost in comparison to mono propellant hydrogen systems then dual mode system it's like one is like uh, monopropellant and another is bipropellant system so that is that could be achieved for different uh, missions so here also it is like so far raised for hydrogen both as fuel for bipropellant and liquid apache like uh, some and monopropellant for on bit on orbit bit control systems it's like for common fuel tank and the propellant systems layout is shown in the pop up with the propellant fuel system design similar to that of bi propellant systems advantages it's like high thrust specific impulse it's like uh, it's the same thing so may more than 3100 newton second per kg for orbit maneuvers and the common fuel tank for attitude and orbit control and can cause higher performance system uh, station keeping thruster it's like power augmented catalytic thruster it is like it could be achieved uh, some 3000 newton second per kg versus ISP of 2900 newton second per kg the pi propellant thrusters yeah we can produce the thrust it can produce a thrust of 10 to 22 newtons disadvantage is it's like 
dual mode system complexity with added valves like that etc and high cost in comparison to monopropellant hydrogen systems then future developments in liquid propellant technology so why we have to use for uh, go for next level of uh, propellant uh, to be invented it should be environmentally friendly and safer propellants because whenever we are using this unsymmetrical unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrogen it is a very corrosive and whenever uh, we are launching the satellites we can see some uh, ammonia gases expelled into the atmosphere that is not good for the atmosphere so it is it produces a lot of pollutions so in that case we have to use but anyhow so as of now we are using it but still we have to do some research to get rid of this type of propellant so the current spacecraft and the satellite users and manufacturers are looking for more environmentally friendly and safe propellants and they can reduce cost by eliminating the need for self contained atmospheric protective ensemble suits that are needed for toxic propellants so whenever we are using this uh, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrogen uh, as a fuel so it produces some uh, corrosive gases so it can uh, damage the spacecraft surface outer surface so that can be avoided if you are using this uh, environmental friendly propellants and moreover extensive and prohibitive propellant safety precautions and isolations of the space vehicle from the par parallel activities and during propellant loading operation can be minimized or eliminated or if used on the satellites the cost of operating of the vehicles can be lowered further lower yeah so the new family of environmental friendly monopropellant has been identified as an alternate to hydrazine so this uh, new propellants are based on blending of uh, hydroxyl ammonium nitrate and uh, ammonium dinitramide or hydrazinium nitroformate nitrous oxide or hydrogen peroxides so when compared to hydrazine the hcn blends are the range of specific chemicals which can uh, exceed that of hydrazine but the testing of hcn based propellants has begun to show promise that could soon be adopted or on board propulsion systems for low earth transfer orbits satellites and consultations and the ionic liquids also some uh, space scientists are research are doing research on this topic and advantage is it's like it's we can call it as a green propellant uh, the reduced hazard of propellant already so the eliminating the need for self contained atmospheric protective suit needed for toxic propellants and uh, no extensive and prohibitive propellant safety precautions and isolations of the space vehicle from parallel activities to propellant load so these are all like advantages okay coming into solid propellant so which is <coughs> yeah attractive for my topic because i did phd from this topic only so solid propellant so solid propellant means it is uh, it's a very easy in terms of uh, casting and uh, in terms of operation so the solid propellant consists of motor case containing propellant grain and nozzle and igniter the main characteristics is like advantages we can see that in general solid propellant motors can deliver the total total specific impulse in one firing and because of modulation is not possible therefore the usage of solid propellant is restricted to its orbit change and impart acceleration requirements it's a simple concept it is like both fuel as well as oxidizer in solid form so you can see the propellant grain and we have the igniter so once we give the ignition so for the propellant grain so it it continuously burn so we don't have to have any high pressure systems to press the, increase the pressure so the, the, because here uh, the solids are becoming into gas so it so it uh, increases the pressure by itself then it during combustion it obviously it uh, releases some heat so the pressure as well as pressure energy and kinetic energy, sorry thermal energy converted into kinetic energy in the nozzle so we can get enough amount of thrust okay so then i uh, will come to the why we are going for the solid propellant yeah, solid propellant you enormous, enormous amount of thrust to escape from the earth gravitational force so you can see always uh, uh, the first stage of any rocket motor it it is mostly solid propellant because it can produce enormous, enormous amount of thrust so i will see the thrust level in the later so in the propellant uh, solid propellant itself we, we can have some two types of uh, propellant grains so whether it is uh, microscopically mixed or 
microscopically mixed. So, for example, it's micro microscopically mixed means it is like uh, it's just a simple example. It is like if you are mixing the uh, salt in water, what will happen? So it mix microscopically so that it is a microscopical mixing. So it is a salt or uh, sugar mixed in the water. But if you are uh, uh, mixing the salt in any kind of uh, oil, what will happen? It is the it, it, the solid uh, salt will retain its original uh, the chemical composition that is in a solid uh, state. Then uh, the oil it will be in oily form. So it, it is like a slurry mixer, but it is not microscopically mixer. That is called composite propellant. Okay, so the examples it's like so nitrocellulose. Because it's like a fibric material, glycerin is the liquid material. So once you mixed it, so it will uh, mix thoroughly in a micro microscopic level. And the additives we are using for stabilizing the propellant and uh, for uh, solidifying the propellant, we are using it. And for composite propellant, we are using ammonium perchlorate and uh, binder material. It is like a HTBB, hydroxyl terminate polybutadiene, and aluminum powder is used for increasing the temperature of the combustion chamber. So it, it could be like by mass, it's like ammonium perchlorate is 62 percentage and the binder material could be like 22 percentage and the aluminum powder could be 15 percentage. And additives like curatives like uh, yeah, some isocyanates we are using for it. So ammonium perchlorate, you can see that that is an oxidizer, but still it contains only four uh, atoms or four uh, oxygen atom remaining is like uh, nitrogen, hydrogen, chlorine, but available and chemically stable oxidizer is ammonium perchlorate. That's why we are using it. The main performance of solid propellant. So you can see that at the thrust level, we can reach up to 50 newtons for spin down and down of satellites and maximum of uh, more than 50,000 newtons for satellite applications. And for satellite launching, the rocket uh, launching applications and uh, delivery specific propulsion could be like a newtons for spin down for small satellites and 10 power 7 newton seconds for satellite orbit transfer applications. And motor specific impulse could be like 2400 newton second per kg. That means it is 240 seconds of ISP at uh, sea level. In vacuum level, yeah, it could be more. It is like two, two sorry. 280 seconds also we can, 260 to 280 seconds of ISP we can achieve for vacuum specific impulse and the system specific impulse could be like yeah, 2300 to 2700 Newton second per kg. And advantages it's like relatively simple operation and very high. Mass fraction, excellent bulk density and packaging characteristics and good long term storage characteristics. So it can be stored for, the, for more than 10 years. But still, we are using that HTBB as a fuel, that is a polymeric rubber kind of material. So after 10 or 15 years, it will degrade. So it's, uh, it, it loses its uh, efficiency. So disadvantages, it's not readily tested and checked out prior to flight. That is the major disadvantage because uh, the propellant mixing, it is like uh, if you are mixing propellant today, let's say some 25 degrees centigrade, it will give some burning rate. But after some one week or two weeks, if you burn the, if you are casting the propellant at a different temperature instead of like uh, 25 degrees centigrade, 30 degrees centigrade, and your moisture level and other things affecting the propellant characteristics. So that is the major uh, disadvantage, but still uh, we, uh, we take some batch of uh, casting uh, solid propellant mixer uh, with static test and uh, we can uh, somehow matches for the flight test, then very difficult to stop or restart. So it's it's not possible because it is both mixed. So we cannot stop in between because in the liquid propellant means we can control the liquid fluoride, uh, flow rate, liquid oxidizer fuel for it. But here it is everything is, uh, it's like a crackers. So once you start it, you cannot stop in between. That is the disadvantage and uh, limited ISP it is uh, 2,400 to 3,000 kg. Then limited redundancy with associated reliability and safety issues. So during casting and uh, 
transferring this propellant to the rocket chamber there is some safety issues so we have to be very careful while uh, mixing the propellant but even all of that so we are using this uh, solid solid propellant for initial stages of rocket launching applications so how we are selecting the propulsion systems based on its based on our requirements so in the selection process the most fundamental criterion for the propulsion systems to be selected is its achievement of spe uh, mission specific impulse and the velocity increment requirements therefore an important consideration for the selection of suitable propulsion systems is the trade off between its velocity increment capability and propulsion system mass you will see that the mass of propulsion systems can be determined with the help of overall propulsion system mass fraction yeah the curves of uh, total of um, um, propellant mass with respect to the total structural mass plotted as a function of del v that is velocity increment for uh, different actual space craft propulsion systems typical values okay that give the first and most important indications for selection of propulsion systems when suitable spacecraft acceleration axillary propulsion systems are selected the refinement of the selection is carried out this process is taken into consideration additional parameters such as cost complexity operational reliability of the systems so first technical parameter is how much delta v that is increment velocity we can achieve with respect to the mass ratio of uh, propellant mass to the structural mass so you can see the cold gas so cold gas we cannot achieve more than some 250 meter per second of del v then if you go for ammonia so monopropellant so we can achieve like 1000 maximum of 1250 meter per second then if you use the mono as a monopropellant hydrazine but also we can achieve like 2000 250 meter per second so then we can go for this uh, bipropellant systems so you can achieve like yeah it's it's the current uh, state of uh, propellant system so you can propellant system so you can see that <coughs> yeah so if you are using hydrazine and uh, nitrous oxide we can uh, go up to 3000 meter per second of velocity increment then uh, if you are going for this if you are using say, electrical uh, electrical based propulsion systems we can achieve more than 3000 meter per second of velocity increment <clears throat> so this is again the same uh, so for high velocity increments by propulsion systems mono propulsion hydrogen system better resistor systems power augmented thrusters and electrostatic systems will satisfy the del v requirement of the achieved missions okay so you can see the <clears throat> different kind of thrust levels and exhaust velocity advantages and disadvantages of different kind of propulsion systems it's a cold gas so just on it mm. So the query box will be open in uh, next few minutes. So we can start for the posting uh, uh, satellite propulsion related questions uh, to Jayaraman sir. And uh, if you want to interact, you can just uh, post it in a uh, um, chat box. I will choose like few questions. Or uh, Jayaraman sir also can able to view it. So he can select people so the, those can interact with Jayaraman sir. <laughs> yeah okay so then, uh, okay thanks uh, jagdish i will continue so you can see that uh, cold gas propulsion systems it's like extremely simple very low it's a reliable and very low cost and very low performance and higher mass level systems and uh, mono propellant means it's low performance higher mass it's uh, we have seen all things uh, so we'll come to this uh, um, advanced propulsion systems it's like after uh, solid propellant we can see that uh, Power augmented catalytic thruster, so it can uh, produce the exhaust gas, uh, the exhaust velocity of 3000 meter per second. It is high performance, low power, simple fit systems, and more complicated interfaces, more power than chemical thrusters and low thrust 
so then arc jet if you are using some hydrogen and stationary plasma thrusters the ion engine so we can reach 16000 uh, meter per second of velocity in mean, high performance high power low thrust complicated and uh, it's a kaufman uk ionic engines so it can produce 30000 meter per second of velocity in uh, velocity so very high performance very high power low thrust and complicated and uh, radio frequency and field emission uh, propulsion system so all this electrical based propulsion system as i mentioned we have to produce electricity it's additional mass burden so that is the major uh, hurdle for using the electrical propulsion system for rocket launch rocket launching applications for for a spacecraft attitude control or orbit control so it can be used and then uh, advanced spacecraft propulsion system so for chemical propulsion system has given to space and has even taken spacecraft through the solar systems the electrical propulsion system still under development offer further vast increase in ion in propulsion efficiency propulsion system mass efficiency the prevailing goal of advanced propulsion system is to enable cost efficient space missions and extended exploration of the solar systems up into interstellar missions in the first instance advanced propulsion systems can be derived for a, for from existing systems by increasing the performance of chemical and electrical propulsion systems with regard to their mission impulse and velocity increment capabilities new approaches are studied or under development like solar thermal rockets using solar energy to heat the propellant via concentrator to high temperature and nuclear thermal rockets we'll see that using heat produced by the nuclear reaction to produce high temperature propellant and beamed momentum propulsion like solar sails and exotic propulsion methods like photon and antimatter propulsion systems we'll see that okay then uh, yeah we'll see the advanced pro space propulsion concepts so we'll see each and everything in the in detail so okay for exploration of solar systems so other than satellites so if we are going for uh, other planets so what is the del v requirement it's like you can see that uh, interplanetary hornman transfer orbits so you can see mercury means we require 17.1 km per second of del v so venus means 5.2 mars means 5.4 or jupiter is 14.4 saturn is required 15.7 uranus it's 15.9 and neptune is 15.7 so this much amount of del v is required for any if you are uh, looking for interplanar interplanar orbit missions then potential increase in uh, performance of existing space propulsion system it's like isp so apart from the usual chemical uh, propulsion systems the emerging class of micro and nano spacecraft require miniaturization miniaturization of the propulsion systems with the help of micro electromechanical system technology for accept values of specific impulse in order to achieve non specific impulse system mass factor with increasing interest in environment and safety issues non toxic propellant nano propellant systems are under development consequently actual designs of chemical spacecraft propulsion systems are well developed but are being complemented by non toxic nano propellants the emerging craft requires micro electromechanical systems it's like ems technology for miniaturization of the propulsion systems uh, it is the my micro propulsion system so you can see that uh, for delvi requirements for low delvi requirements we can use this kind of uh, yeah decentralized the propulsion system into small small uh, thrusters so we can achieve the enough amount of thrust because uh, the complication and other things are uh, less here so, uh, instead of like using some big system we have to go for very high pressure very high temperature so it's like uh, yeah it's like small small thrusters we can uh, keep it yeah so that's like consists of number of thruster parts and each containing four propellant thrusters and proper uh, thruster parts have a specific a spherical shape it's like 42.5 mm in independent uh, diameter and accommodate four independent nozzles the micro propellant systems may be also used for large spacecrafts but which need high resolution for stabilization and attitude control because each and every nozzle 
has to be directed or has to be positioned in a particular direction so then only we can achieve the required amount of thrust otherwise yeah because the the thrust vector is collapsed so then we cannot get enough amount of thrust in that case this is micro propulsion systems so then solar thermal simple technology but still the solar can if we can use this uh, fuel and if it goes into the heat exchanger surface where the in the heat exchanger surface the heat is uh, supplied from the solar reflectors so we can use some concave surface of uh, solar reflector so that it concentrates the solar uh, rays into a particular point so that we can get some amount of uh, thermal that is heat that uh, so then uh, the fuel can be can uh, get some heat energy so before it enters to the combustion chamber so that we can get some amount of thrust here so this is like possible application for future transfer transfer or the transfer applications so here in the solar thermal rockets so use of limitless power limitless power of the sun to produce relatively high thrust it's yeah we can produce like 5 to 10 newtons of continuous thrust if uh, the solar power is around 70 kilowatt exhaust velocity we can uh, get up to 8000 meter per second basic engineering problems limited thrust levels due to limit in heat transfer from heat exchanger to the propellant so we have to have some high thermal conductivity material like <coughs> copper or uh, yeah so copper is the high thermal conductivity material but copper is yeah it, it, it will get oxidized so that would be use some coating then if you are using some coating that will reduce the overall heat transfer so that issues are there in addition the deployment and steering of large mirrors to collect and focus the solar energy presence and an operational challenge then the status it's like several concepts for solar thermal bubble systems have been proposed then solar sailing so it is like concept solar sails accelerate under the pressure of solar radiation caused by momentum transfer from the reflector solar photons thus requiring no propellant its, its force is proportional to the sail area can be directed by tilting the sail with respect to the incoming solar flux because no propellant is used here so the solar sail has an infinite specific impulse so so since we are not using any propellant so its uh, sp is very high but still the the thrust weight to ratio is very very low it's minus 4 to power minus 5 newton per meter square, kilometer squared the solar sail if uh, the solar pressure is around one armstrong typical applications it, uh, it can be used for interplanetary cargo missions or uh, interstellar travels and status all attempts to unfold solar sail in space have so far failed because of the thrust limitations it is for a uh, solar sailing uh, the odc has uh, developed this in 19 99 for uh, that is german aerospace and dlr and the european space agency okay so the schematic of solar sail positions during one or an or one earth orbit so let's say if you are uh, using some uh, solar sail uh, for uh, satellite then uh, each and every time the solar sail has to be focused towards the sun surface so then only we can get enough amount of thrust otherwise we cannot get so that is the major limitation because orientation and the positioning of solar sail at different uh, orbit positions <coughs> it's a very challenging process and then uh, exotic propulsion system that's like antimatter and photon propulsion these are all like uh, yeah virtual concepts but this could be possible so exotic propulsion systems are those of far out ideas still under study they will be required the, for the ultimate dream of space exploration to travel to other star systems it's like uh, for tv shows yeah we can you could have seen the star trek uh, show the antimatter propulsion system it's like uh, it offers highest possible physical energy density of any known reaction substance it's like since matter and antimatter annihilate each other com 
completely it is an incredibly compact way of storing energy it's like a round trip to mars it's we require 100 ton payload might require only 30 gram of antimatter you can imagine how much it is how much less it is however sufficient production and storage of antimatter potential complex and high storage systems mars is still very much in the so it is like a nuclear kind of system so so nuclear it produces it creates so much amount of energy but the problem is storage and the storage risk and operational risk safety issues and the other thing is wastage the nuclear waste that is also a big issue nowadays because nuclear uh, waste can radiate uh, give radiations for about uh, so you can unmute <laughs> Right. Oh, can you hear me or not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay, okay. The general and the photon generation of usual usual dust by ejection of photons is still very hypothetic, but still the generation of photons by laser technology and the subsequent decay in space and involves the mass energy transfer expressed by Einstein equation. It's like E M C squared. So Einstein has uh, proposed this uh, several decades ago. consequently very large quantities of energy will be required even for nominal levels of dust possibly matter and antimatter annihilation can be harnessed for photon propulsion system in the future near future uh, our rocket pioneer one brown has proposed that i have learned to use the word impossible with the greatest possible caution what is like we can say it is impossible but sometimes it could be possible in the future we can we hope so this could be achieved okay so thanks for listening to all so then i will uh, come back from the sharing option